Well, the gang's all here. <laughs> So if you've ever seen one of our live streams or the Barbie video or you're currently looking at your screen right now, you've probably noticed this disgusting monstrosity of random weird books around me. I had this idea months ago to start creating this booktuber wall. I said in the Kate Corain video, I'm not really big on like bibliophilia or promoting consumerism of literature for its own sake. But what I left out is I'm really into engagement farming. So my idea with this booktuber wall is to put not really books that I like, but books that I think are going to get commented on. You know, like what's really weird to have, what's going to get someone angry and make comments about how bad my taste in literature is, Things like that. That's why I have these like light lark inserts taped to the wall or uh, all of our Onision books and I think Nova's playlist and the J.A. Johnstone books are up there too. Stuff like that. The only problem is I haven't really made a lot of videos since making this in the first place because it's just so much easier to edit when there's not a video component to think about. I learned that the hard way with the light lark D&D stuff. But I have some really big videos in the works and I want to make sure that like my recording space is up and running. So I kind of came up with this idea on the fly. I have no idea how this is going to go, but we'll see. This is probably going to be SBU's most straightforward and normal video. It's going to be a classic booktube uh, bookshelf tour video, I think they call it. You see, so we have this booktuber wall, but behind you is a bigger bookshelf. And then on the other side is this glassed in bookshelf that I'm going to kind of run you guys through and we're going to find any weird ones or popular ones and do this HGTV kind of home renovation thing where we try to optimize this space and see what we can make out of it. I have kind of amassed this collection of weird books that I usually just buy for the bit or get from a thrift store. So we'll see if there's any way we can make order out of that. And then hopefully I'll have some like funny anecdotes on the way. So the full story for my booktuber wall is it all started with these three light boxes right here. I was watching that Red Letter Media video about VHS preservation or whatever, and I wanted to do something similar with the books that I had sentimental value for. Of course, I have Empress Teresa because I have to. That was just like my regular copy that I read for the podcast. There's nothing special about it. Down here is the signed copy of Handbook for Mortals that Lanny Sarum made out to me and sent me after we did the interview, which to this day is probably the coolest thing I've ever done. And I did a short on this, but I did find this Lightlark arc in a Goodwill somewhere, which is nuts because at press time, these are like $100 a pop. I got this one for $5. I haven't really paged through to see if there's anything interesting in the changes, but it's just cool to have. I have a bunch of like weird random decorations. This right here is the family tree from Zola's Le Jean Macat, but um, the text is too small, cursive, and French for me to actually understand any of it. And it's just kind of random stuff. I got a lot of light lark memorabilia from this auction on eBay. I think whoever sent this to me, bless their heart, thought that I was like an actual booktuber who like was a shill. It came with these fancy stickers and tea bags and these like <laughs> adult coloring books or like adult first grade homework. I can't describe it. I, I think I gave it to Jay or threw it away or something. I'm kicking myself for it. it. It was like this worksheet where you could fill out the title of the book, the genre, a quick like paragraph summary. And then it had like peppers it had five peppers that you could color in to denote the spice rating <laughs> just like why would you ever want that but it was just so sweet and i feel so bad and finally we just have like random albums this is uh swans my father will guide me up a rope to the sky which i know is like a pedestrian swans album but it was my first little mouth and my birth are still two of my favorite songs in the world. So you, you can't take that from me. I'm not going to be a purist about it. 
So other than my light boxed Zenith arc, there's really not too much to that side of the wall to point out. I'm kind of just saving room for my collector's edition of Light Lark that should be coming a couple months from now. But I do want to show off this absolutely ridiculous, like, book box, bookish box. I can't remember what service it was because I got it off of eBay. But it's like, look at this. Is this supposed to be Isla? Like, it's the funniest thing in the world. I've taken a couple scans of this because there's art on the inside of the dust jacket that I just think is so funny. And it's just like, who is this for? Who wants this? It's like, it's a beautiful book. Like, don't get me wrong. It's got like the gold cover and everything under the dust jacket. But it's just, it's light lark. Why would you do so much for Light Lark? <laughs> That's a very horrible purchase decision that I made. I'm kind of debating because, like, with the dust jacket, it doesn't look that interesting. But without, it looks really cool. But then I might risk misplacing the funny art. So I really, I really don't know what to do. Uh, I think this actually does look better on my shelf, though. Maybe I can, like paste it up on my wall i don't know i'm kind of worried about like messing with the dust jacket or something i'll figure it out but for right now i think i've decided i'm going with the golden spine for this one so on the other side of where my head is going to be over the page inserts of all the stupid light lark characters it's kind of just more english club podcast books there's a couple exceptions here and i think this is really where i was dropping the ball but they do kind of have some sentimental value to me. I, I don't know. Here, let me show you a couple of them. So like I said, a lot of them you'll already recognize, but I do have On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous up there because I think I talk a lot about my uh, animosity for this book. I, a lot of people love this, and I've like started arguments over how little I like this book, but I guess I just don't have the poetry brain required. I think I can like recite it from memory. It's like a, it's no surprise, Ma, that a comma resembles a fetus because within all of us is something about pauses or stopping. I don't know, but it is no surprise, Ma, that a comma resembles a fetus. It's just a sentence that my my incompetent prose mind cannot comprehend and he showed up on that one Gus Dapperton album from the other time that we tried to do like a booktube style video so I just kind of have this I I read it like on Nook when I first got it but I wanted a physical copy I don't think this ultimately belongs on my booktuber wall though so I'm gonna keep this guy off to the side See, like, I can't even show you guys this right. It's a, a collection of, like, Guy de Maupassant short stories in French. Uh, we can't choisi. I have no idea what we can't choisi means. But uh, it's got, like, the classics. It's got two friends. I think it was supposed to be, like, a French student's reader. I don't know very much French at all. Everything I know comes from, like, Joey Star and Supreme NTM. So, like... I just kind of have this for fun, but I'm a big fan of Maupassant. I started like seriously studying his works in early undergrad and that kind of galvanized like my love for prose over poetry and kind of created this rift between me and Jay ultimately. And speaking of undergrad, these next couple of books kind of warrant a little bit of a preface. So it was... The end of Jay's undergrad career, I don't think I was even like helping them move. I think I just showed up at their apartment one day while they were moving and I noticed this throwaway box or like a Goodwill box full of these old books of theirs. And I'm like, Jay, you can't just get rid of all these books. You know, they have so many memories attached to them, even if they were like your literature books for school or whatever. So these were German literature books. And my heart was broken. I couldn't let them get rid of it. So I, I, I took like two or three of them. And lo and behold, years later, I have not touched them either. So this is going to be the first time that I'm ever looking at these uh, was with you guys. First up, we have um, Imgad Coins das Kunstseidene Mädchen, which I think means um, the artificial silk girl. 
Doris, the artificial silk girl, is a secretary for a, like, lawyer, I guess? Uh, she wants out of her province and to conquer the big world. In Berlin, she breaks into the world of dance halls and bars and literature cafes and something about high society. There's a lot of promises of entertainment and satire. I don't know. I may read this one day. I don't, my German's not what it used to be, but I'm not from my booktuber wall. I do remember this day, like, really fondly for the life of me. Jay, if you're watching this, like, comment why I was at your apartment stealing your books. But I do have such a nostalgia for that specific time, but I don't remember why. I gotta show this one. So, so. Der kurze Brief zum langen Abschied, which is the, uh, the short letter to a long separation. Uh, and on the back, I tried to see what it was about, and it just says... In my book, I try to describe a hope that one can piece by piece develop, which sounds like a more benign Rich Shapiro quote. So I think this is the first unhaul of the day. I have no desire to read this book whatsoever. So I'm sorry, Peter Hanke or any fans of his, but I don't care. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. So this next bookshelf, the one between the signed copy of Handbook for Mortals, Joe Camel, and that album. This one I did kind of have a pattern for. Again, I don't think I had a pattern that showed up well on video. So these are books that I generally like, like a little bit more. Some of these are like legitimately some of my favorite books. And then sometimes I just have them for personal interest. So starting out... We have Pride and Prejudice. I featured this on a short that I did. The funniest book I've ever read. I'm so mad that it took me so long to read it. I don't know why I slept on it, but like, I don't know. It's like one of those books that would change your life if you read it at the right point. And I did not. Uh, actually, I don't recommend you read it. I recommend you find this one audiobook because the reader is just so funny and she just has these affects for all the different characters that really brings it together. I feel like if I tried to read it dry, I wouldn't be able to understand some of like the subtleties and tone and affectation that she just kind of like breezes through. But I, I love this book. Genuinely, it is one of the funniest things in the world to me. Next up, I have the uh, National Epic of Estonia, written entirely in Estonian, which is a language that I cannot understand. I may pick up learning Estonian again. I don't think it's going to turn into any good content, but just know that I'm like doing that in between uploads or whatever. Uh, one day I'll be able to understand this guy. I don't know why I bought like the pure Estonian version and not something that was like parallel translated into literally any other freaking language in the world, but here we are. Ocean Vuong's Time is a Mother, I actually really enjoyed. I know I was like talking mad shit about uh, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, but when he's actually writing poetry, when he's in the realm that he belongs, I'm okay with some of the ways that Ocean Vuong conveys certain information, if that makes sense. It's hard to articulate if you don't have my very specific mentality about literature and have read On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. I probably sound like the biggest asshole in the world to this random guy, but uh, this is actually a good poetry compilation. So this, and speaking of Kate Corain, Marianne Baruch's Cadaver Speak. So if you remember when I was talking about like my opinions about Goodreads and the way that I use Goodreads, this is the book that's signed to me. And what does she say? She calls me a wild-eyed proser, which I kind of took offense to because like, I don't know like how I seem on camera, especially to strangers, but like, I don't think I'm wild-eyed. What does that even mean? It was like, I was like creeping her out or something. I don't know. Like this was, this was like in 2018. So I don't remember how I was like then. Uh, but I took off a star on my Goodreads review for that. So if that makes me a review bomber, I'm so sorry. Uh, Marianne Baruch, I hope you're watching this because, because I just feel so bad about it. I was going to wonder aloud why I have Plato's Republic, but then I flipped it over and I saw a $3 price tag on it which is the only conceivable reason that I would ever buy this book. I tried to read this before, 
I just cannot understand anything about it. It goes back to my thing about Greek myths. Like, all of this is just flying right over my head. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be getting out of this book. And it's really hard to say that I just want to get rid of this because it says on the front here, Christmas 1995, love Sandy and dad, which is the saddest thing in the world that it ended up in whatever crappy secondhand bookstore that I got this from in college. But I don't know, like, I don't want it. I'm not going to read it. It doesn't look good on camera. Uh, I think this is going to be for someone else now. Maybe hopefully it'll be reunited with whoever callously gave this away. So I was talking about funny books earlier with Pride and Prejudice. This one is also hilarious and also really hard to show up on camera. Uh, John Irving's The Cider House Rules. Best gallows humor that I have ever read in my life. I'm a big John Irving, like, sucker. I've never seen the movie with that guy from Wilfred or whatever, but this book is great. This book is really, really good. It's one of my, like five-star reads. I don't know if it's like one of my favorite books in the world, but I can't imagine any other situation where a guy chasing after a train with a corpse in it would be half as interesting and hilarious as it was in this book. So it's a little bit off-putting in terms of its subject material, but I think it's all handled like really well. I wouldn't be worried about recommending this to anyone. And then finally for this shelf, we have Ulysses by James Joyce, which I have a really complicated relationship with James Joyce. I loved him in high school because I was pretentious and I thought I knew everything. And I soured on him in college. And then I started to really hate him. And now I'm just kind of indifferent to the guy. There's not really much separating James Joyce and Ernest Klein other than like, education. Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, this modernist stuff that James Joyce was doing, follows a lot of the same traps that Ernest Cline fell into of name the thing that exists and quote the thing that exists. The difference is obviously that James Joyce is quoting and naming things that are a lot more erudite than 80s movies properties or whatever stupid crap that Ernest Cline likes. But if your entire humor and sense of literary value can be explained by like hyperlinks, I, I feel like that's not very transformative. So He's not the, the genius that I thought he was in high school, but I still have like a healthy amount of respect for him. Also, fun fact, we started recording the English Club podcast when Jay and I lived in the same city. We don't anymore, which is why the faceless over Discord paradigm has overtaken that podcast but we started out i recorded it it's deleted now but there was video of me and jay sitting in this like sort of like this this artfully placed bookshelf and we were talking about empress Teresa. i kept it in i have no idea why but jay did pull this book out and said like Odysseus but spelled wrong by James Joyce and I kept that in the final version so that's just a little bit of like podcast trivia for you if you're interested why Ulysses by James Joyce of all things came up in that conversation. So over here by the Lightlark arc we have like random books because usually this doesn't show up on frame when I'm doing certain angles. There's not too much to talk about here so I'll just kind of speed round through it. We got um, two different reference books on writing, the Columbia Dictionary of Modern Literary Cultural Criticism, and uh, what is this called? The Handbook to Literature. I think I bought them because they were in the bibliography of like a Wikipedia article I was reading about like story structure or something, and I wanted to sound like smarter on a podcast episode, but they're both formatted like dictionaries or encyclopedias, so they're not interesting, and when they do have interesting things, it's like a paragraph or two. So this, I already talked about Prayer for Owen Meany by John Irving. I don't know what it is about John Irving. I just like... I like people who ramble. One day I'm going to do a whole video on Moby Dick, but this is exactly the same reason I like Moby Dick now that I think about it. I just like it when people ramble about the things that they're passionate about. Even if I don't care, I like seeing that other people care about stuff. John Irving's narrative style is just bouncing from thing to thing to thing, and you can't always follow it in the moment, but there's always like that 
that through line of passion and i think that's what really gets me about these books they're they're always really fun even though they're massive this is zenith and nexus i'm not talking about these uh jay refuses to read nexus i would read nexus but jay doesn't want to so i'm just gonna have to wait till we're in like a dry period of the english club podcast i just kind of bought them just in case i would ever need them because i'm like a completionist but uh this is like a cool copy of like the entire His Dark Material series bound together. I haven't really read these through ever, but I really liked the concept of them early on in my life because I thought it was like edgy and anti-Catholic, even though it was, I mean, it is, but it's like, it's a YA book. Like, come on. I have no idea what this is. I have no idea where I got this. If I had to guess, I just bought it because it looked cool. But skimming through it for the first time ever, it appears to be apologetics, which I don't feel like I want on my booktuber wall. So I think I'm gonna, um, I think we're gonna give this away to uh, another lucky person out there. So this book actually like prompted me to make the Sonic High School video. I wanted to do a Sonic High School video since like 2016. I've I've wanted to do this forever, but I didn't have SBU at the time. I didn't have like the wherewithal, but this was like the key is uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's City of Girls. I, I read this because some podcast I listened to was talking about it and it sounded interesting, but it really made me realize that there are different kinds of frame stories. I don't know how obvious it is, but this is a thick book and I said it in the video, this opens up as a letter. So we're supposed to understand that this is a 500 page letter that this random old lady sent to someone else when that person sent her a letter asking what her dad was to this old lady. That didn't make any sense, but it's just like, it's a letter. It's a 500 page letter. And like, the book is fine. I don't really have a problem with anything in the book, but Elizabeth Gilbert wanted me to think of this as a letter and it just distracted me the whole time. I don't know. It sucks. It makes me mad. This is If We Were Villains by ML Rio. I read this like two years ago. I thought it was all right. I stole this from Lei, my Discord moderator, and I haven't given this back to her. So I don't know if I want to talk about this one yet, but this is 44 Years in the Life of a Hunter by Mishach Rowan. What? Meshach Browning. <laughs> so I got this in the corner of some dusty ass of antique store. My whole thing is, and I've been hung up on this idea. I've thought about doing like a video on this, but I can't quite find like the through line or the angle. Maybe I will one day, but I'm a big fan of Blood Meridian. I've mentioned it a bunch of times and it's so interesting to me that like Judge Holden, like the creepy scary man was a real person. And documented in this guy's diary so i wanted to do this like exploration through random obscure books like people's memoirs and stuff and try to find like creepy characters in it and this is one of them but it's honestly kind of boring work and i just don't feel like doing it i just have it maybe one day i'll get back into it and try to find something but uh so far haven't found much so this top shelf right here is where I think I have my biggest misses. I mentioned this already. I love Moby Dick. It's my favorite book ever, but I, I don't know what Indigo Field even is. I can't remember where I got that book. Uh, September House I like, but not like booktuber wall like. Those are my novelty copies of Lord of the Rings, which are nigh illegible because they're such small font. It was just like a gift I got one year. There's The Tsar's Madman by Jan Gross, which apparently I've been mispronouncing because I can't like enunciate properly in Estonian. But I mentioned that in my Sonic High School video. Blood Meridian, of course. Secret History, of course. I think both of those I would probably want to have more front and center. And then there's Fourth Wing. And then this is another one that Jade never wants to do. But... I got this in Greece. It's not Iron Wing. It's Siderenia Flora. And I just like, I don't, I don't know any Greek, but I got it on vacation because I was like, what is the most rancid thing I could get 
on this Greek vacation. I don't know if we're ever going to have an Iron Wing episode on the podcast, but there's always hope. So I've kind of angled us differently here to get a good view of the like cabinet. I don't know what you would call it, but the reason I got this is I had books that I wanted to protect, but not like completely cut off access from. Like the light boxes, they're kind of a bit. The light lark arc might be kind of valuable, but like that Empress Teresa is not up there because it's valuable or rare or anything. It's just, it's just because I thought it was funny. So these, I am a little bit more serious about keeping in a certain condition. I don't necessarily care about like these showing up on a video or something. Maybe they'd show up on like live streams if I'm at this angle or whatever, but it's, that's not the important thing. This is actually the reason I bought this in the first place. So remember I was talking about SARS Madman up here by Jan Gross. So this is the original printing of that book and you'll see it's held together by tape and the glare makes it impossible to show off. But I don't know, it's kind of a cool piece of history to have. It was written in this very turbulent time in history and Gauss was like in and out of prison for political writings. Even the peripheral stuff is interesting to me from a historical perspective. You see at the back here, so it says Jan Gross Imperatorski Bezumech Roman Na Estonieskom. I don't know what any of that actually means. Hudochik o formitele v azi. I can sound out the Cyrillic alphabet, but I don't know Russian or Ukrainian or any other language written in the Cyrillic alphabet. When you try to learn Greek, the spirit of Cyril himself just comes upon you and imparts knowledge of this alphabet. I've never like actually studied it or anything. It just magically happened. So if any of this is interesting and you speak Russian, let me know. Uh, I'm too lazy to pop this into Google Translate because the Russian keyboard layout really pisses me off. So this is just like a book that I want to make sure that I keep in as good condition as I can. I didn't really get it in the best of conditions, but I don't want it to get any worse, you know? I also wanted to show off um, this copy of Emile Zola's uh, Le Vent de Paris, whatever that means. I don't speak French. So this is another one that I just found at an antique store and I thought I would pick up because it looks so cool. This one might end up on my booktuber wall now that I'm thinking about it. But Zola, I also kind of have a complicated relationship with, uh, mostly on the positive side, not like James Joyce where I've kind of gotten disillusioned. So Zola, Maupassant, and Balzac all kind of represented French naturalism, which is a huge influence on like my personal craft. And Zola had this whole thing inspired by Balzac, but I don't know too much about him, where he would try to make this intergenerational novel. I have the family tree that I pointed out there. That's something I think is really cool from like a documenting how society and life is. I'm also really hung up on Zola's concept of the experimental novel, which is basically literally what it sounds like. It's putting characters together and seeing how they respond to each other in a chemical sort of way. And he had this whole like crazy theory where this could be used to change laws and society and it all falls apart when you think for two seconds about, hey, this is fiction. Like, even if it's completely convincing, some guy just made it up. But I still think it's, like, interesting as, like, an aspirational goal to make fiction that's so compelling that it could be used to more objectively understand real life. I think that's worth pursuing, even if you ultimately can't ever get to that point. So one day I'll pick French up again. I, I did 
try to learn it in high school. I got kind of far with it, but it's all gone now. Like, I don't have any comprehension of the French language. So one of these days I'll pick it back up. It can't be that hard. I was lying. I do have a Balzac, but it is in Greek. So <laughs> I don't know. But mostly what's in here are like my foreign language books. Up top is a couple German Game of Thrones. Uh, when I was first learning German, this was like super helpful for me to learn just like through immersion because I read the English Game of Thrones like so many times over and over that it was like a cheat code to learning another language. And I tried to do something similar with Aragon. Uh, you'll see over there on the far left, uh, that's actually in Greek. I got that a long time ago to try to do like the same immersion learning, but I don't know if Greek is just way more difficult or I don't have that same level of like connection to Aragon as a text, but never really got too far with that. Down here is a whole line of books that are like not really special, but autographed to me specifically. I go to a lot of events at the local bookstore and try to just buy a copy of like everything that I go to. I'm sorry if any of these are good or important, but I really haven't read any of them. But I also don't want to give them away because they're signed to me specifically. So I don't really know what to do with them. So that's kind of why they're on this shelf. But I do have this collector's edition of The Fault in Our Stars by John Green, just for the hell of it. I know the way that we perceive John Green as a society has really changed ever since it was revealed what his favorite tastes are on Tumblr, but I really have a soft spot for the guy and even this book. I did buy it like recently though, just because I thought it would like piss people off for me to have it. My original copy's around here somewhere. It's um heavily, heavily annotated because I just remember being in high school and like not being able to focus on anything else. I was so enthralled in that book. And I know that's like so cringe to say now in the year of our Lord current year, but in 2014, this was, this was something else. And I've always wanted to like understand how that magic works, even though it hasn't really aged well now, if that makes sense. So this one, especially because it's like a non-standard color is absolutely going on the booktuber wall because I know a lot of people really don't like John Green, really don't like this book in particular. Uh, I think it would be funny. So now that we're talking about lame high school books, I also wanted to talk about uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek by Annie Dillard, which is another one of those books that like fundamentally altered my brain chemistry when I was 17. It's a collection of creative nonfiction short stories and kind of like in a James Joyce way, she draws from all of these different religious backgrounds and all of this like very poetic prose that comes together and a lot of it you're kind of trying to decipher but it's like chasing a high every now and then it'll hit in just the right way and you feel like you are in the woods staring at these dead bugs with this insane woman it is a spiritual experience at random points uh you can't make it happen reliably but i will crack this open about every year and just like try to find the next vein or whatever because it's really just beautiful what she's able to do with these completely mundane subjects. It, a lot like Fault in Our Stars, this is something that I've annotated over and over trying to understand how she was able to mine all of these experiences out of seeing dead animals or watching geese fly, all of these things you never think about being spiritual experiences get elevated to these ridiculous degrees. So this is like life-changing. If this is not assigned to you in high school, this is something that you should pick up. Don't worry about the Jordan Peterson book. I stole that from my grandfather for his own good and also for the bit because we've done so many Jordan Peterson things that I just kind of wanted to have that. Conflict Born, I do want to talk about a little bit. <laughs> I'm just going to be completely honest. I DNF'd it five pages in, but Richard Fife was stalking his own shelves at this bookstore I was at, and I asked him for, like, an elevator pitch, and he delivered it like a freaking champ. Like, I could never pitch something to a stranger 
at the drop of a hat like that. So if nothing else, uh, he's very, very good at the business side of things. Maybe I'll give it a second chance. Uh, I wasn't in a very charitable mood when I read it, I recall. It's like about zero G pirates in interdimensional portals. You know, it sounds so cool when you pitch it, but when you read it and you try to understand all of these concepts on the fly, it just gets so fatiguing and overwhelming. But if, if steampunk, zero g pirates on interdimensional ships interests you absolutely check it out do you want to start a podcast i bought as a joke because i saw that at a bookstore and i thought it'd be a funny thing to post on my instagram story uh this is not good it's not helpful uh if you have ever put something on the internet you know everything in this book so I i'm giving it away so for my writing desk i don't think i'm going to get a good angle on this because it is like catty corner from you guys. So we're just gonna do our best here. I'll use a lot of B-roll, we'll figure it out. These shelves are all just kind of like random crap to be honest with you. Some of it is reference books. Some of it is books I've had since high school that I haven't really thought about and just randomly put on the shelf. Random books that I pick up here and there. Uh, we're just gonna try to make sense of it did you see that? That was so scary. So I wanted to start with the bottom up here because this book is actually kind of what prompted me to do this video in the first place because I see a lot of booktubers with the Priory of the Orange Tree on their shelves and it always gets comments because it's so fat and so cool looking that like you can't help but ask about it if you don't know what it is. And I actually like this book. Um, this was compared semi-favorably to a work in progress of mine and then I read it and I was like okay I actually kind of like this and it set me straight in kind of what I was doing with that project. I've kind of put that on the back burner for right now but it was still really cool to see so I have like a very selfish soft spot for this book. It's not like a life-changing five-star read like some of the other stuff I was gushing about but definitely still worth reading. Um, I'm definitely going to want to put this on my booktuber wall, even though it is like falling apart because I don't take good care of my books at all. If you're like a fan of the English Club podcast and you like the literary criticism we do, which I'm really hoping that whoever you are, you're better than where we're at. But if you're interested, uh, this I did read a lot before we started this project. Uh, doing literary criticism. I have no idea where I found this book. I just picked it up off Amazon. Um, really, really good. It lays out all the different lenses of criticism, the different kind of things to think about. This kind of set the stage for how I wanted to handle the podcast as a format. I had a lot of experience coming into it from like real life critique groups, but this is kind of really what gave it the academic edge that I try to insert in these unsuccessfully, but this is this is why I try. So it's worth checking out if you're interested. And speaking of inspirations, this was like my fiction 101 like side textbook wonder book by Jeff Vandermeer. Really interesting illustrations I'll show you, but it's kind of like a quirky textbook geared at science fiction and fantasy writers. I really liked it in freshman year, but the older I get, the more depressing it is to read this book. They talk so much about these quirky characters that live in your mind and talk to you and you're writing just to get them free on the page and you're creating these beautiful, vibrant worlds that only you can understand. And there's a lot of this like, I don't know, like, look at me, I'm so special stuff on display here that resonates a lot with a pretentious 20 year old. But now that like, I'm a little bit more mature, I guess, or now that I have like a different direction that I'm taking my craft, like I mentioned, I'm not really interested in freeing the quirky characters of my mind. I consider fiction more of like, an experiment in human interaction in society and that sort of thing. It, a lot of it rings hollow and gives me like this weird imposter syndrome that I didn't have before, which 
is doubly complicated because I don't want to be like these people, you know? Like, it's kind of... The way that they talk about it is kind of cringe and all these, like, quirky characters that they draw makes it seem a little bit weird and lame. And that's not really, like, why I create and engage with literature, at least not anymore. So I don't know if I can really recommend it, but it was a huge part of, like, my development. So you'll see a lot of high school stuff, uh, random, like, encyclopedias and compilation books that I don't want to get rid of because I'm worried, like, they're gifts from distant family members who will come into my house and ask where they are, and then I'll have to, like, be an asshole. There's my heavily, heavily annotated Fault in Our Stars book, which I will not show you because it is very cringe. But here's this other part. It's not really uh, a recommendation so much as Andrew Lore. This is the Best American Short Stories and from 2010. So this is super old. Uh, these are the first short stories that I ever read through and annotated and like deep read in like a, I'm a writer and I'm trying to understand the craft of writing thing. So here's what I meant by like craft books. I have all of this random swath of books on writing, on theory, on craft. A lot of them I feel cringy even showing you guys that I own, but I, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, you'll notice some screenwriting stuff. I, I never really wanted to do screenwriting, but like it was like a personal project that I did for school in grade school. So I just I just kept them with screenwriting. I'm, I, I would never want to do it, but there's something very interesting in how you're constantly improvising and trying to control for these variables that don't exist in a like traditional book publication setting you have to adapt for like actors coming and going people dying people might cancel your show out of nowhere so you always have to hedge your bets and bury seeds in this way that you never have to do in literature and that creates all these little like ambiguities that would be completely intolerable in a book but are par for the course in a TV show where you're trying to decide, okay, I may go for 30 years, I may go for six months, I have to adapt to that. So I don't think it's like worthless to study, but I have no interest in screenwriting whatsoever. And I actually find it very hard to read scripts. I also don't like theater for this reason. It's just a lot of the craft of prose is lost, obviously, and it's just pure dialogue. So. Uh, it's hard for me to get into. Okay, so this is a twofer. And this is another thing I was thinking of about like gathering engagement. Um, I have a copy of Infinite Jest because of course I do, right? Of course I do. But here's the bit. Here's the bit. Here's why I'm better than other people is because I bought this book for the sole purpose of never reading it. I have not looked at a single page of this book and I never will because... I don't want to be someone who pretends to understand or even have read Infinite Jest. I want to be someone who purposefully has chosen not to read Infinite Jest. However, it would be very funny to have that book up there and have people think that I'm like really pretentious and full of myself. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this up front and center. Ditto Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. Um, this is gibberish. I understand that there is a method to his madness and that there is in fact like a pattern and I think there's like a whole interactive website for at least a couple sections of this book outlining like the etymological origins of every single made up word in this book but it is functionally gibberish and anyone who tells you that they understand this book is lying I'm sorry so I'm also going to have this one front and center because I think it shows up relatively well uh, at least you can see the James Joyce thing, so. The only other thing on this shelf is the uh, graphic novel prequel to the movie Southland Tales, which I don't care what you guys say is one of the best movies I've ever seen. I think about it almost daily. A good friend of mine got this for me and didn't tell me that he had gotten this for me. And it was like a day after I had watched it. So I thought like someone was following me. I had this like really weird existential crisis about it. Apparently there are six of these. So I highly recommend you see the movie. I think these are kind of hard to come by, but at least watch the movie. <laughs>
<laughs> it'll it'll really change your opinion on things. There's Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. I got this recommendation from like a mutual on Goodreads, and I read this when I had a horrible, horrible fever. So you read like these vivid descriptions of climbing through Mount Everest, and then you're shivering your ass off in your bed, and it is the most vivid fever dream I've ever had. I have no interest in mountain climbing, and now I feel like I've done it. This is a German book that I did not get from Jay. I found it in the middle of nowhere, little free library, little reading book about liberalism. Um, I will never read this book. And then I have no idea how to get into the story of this book with you guys. This is... 13 Lebensgedichte uh, by Konstantinos Kavathis, which will, you will notice is not a German name. So I am in a bookshop in Athens and I'm talking to the shopkeep or whatever they're called in a bookstore. So I was trying to speak Greek. Like I wasn't even using Duolingo. I was using the discontinued, like declassified FSI briefings on Greek, which are declassified. So they're like decades and decades old. And Greek is a very fluctuating language. So like, I barely understand what I barely understand. And what I do understand is like super outdated. So I'm having this awful, awful conversation trying to get across, hey, I'm learning Greek. I know German. I'd rather get something that's not in English just for kind of like the novelty of it. So she points me to this and it has the original Greek poem right next to the German translation. And I'm like, wow, awesome. This is really cool. I love this. I'm reading it at a cafe and I feel so cool and I take it home and then Jay comes to visit me and I lend it to them and I'm like, Jay, you also have an interest in this kind of stuff. They read it, it's a it's a short book. They read it in an afternoon and they give it back to me. And they were like, why didn't you mention how gay this book was? And I was like, cause I didn't realize that. They're not very gendered poems. They're love poems, but they're not very gendered. So you can't really tell who the speaker is talking about. And then Jay points out these drawings, which I hitherto had just thought were like scribbles, but no, these are like, full willies on display here that I just did not notice until Jay pointed them out to me. It's like the craziest thing that's ever occurred to me. I, I did not notice these willies when I purchased this book. It's very good. Like, not the willies, but the poems. The, the poems are very good, but the problem is this isn't on Goodreads, so I can't be like, cool and pretentious by advertising that I've read this book and understood it, but I, I really kind of took multiple L's with this whole situation. All right, so last couple ones I want to talk about. Um, my book of... Oh my god, you can't even see that. My reference book of Greg Shorthand, which I know, most interesting thing in the entire world, but hear me out, hear me out. So I was listening to an audiobook of Dracula a couple months ago, and Dracula is a really, really fun book, and they talk so much about shorthand. And that's the part that stuck with me is like, I want to learn this like code language that people used to know back in the 1800s, 1900s. So I picked this up, and I know before anyone corrects me, I know the shorthand that they were using in Dracula was probably Pittman because Greg is like the new version, but Greg is like a lot easier. It took me two days to learn shorthand and I'm not like some kind of like savant or anything. It is really easy. And that's kind of like my boomer opinion is I don't care about cursive. I hate cursive. I can't read cursive. I don't want to read cursive. Cursive was invented for a writing utensil that is no longer popular today. There is no reason to have cursive ever, but it is a tragedy that we don't learn shorthand anymore because it's so easy, it's so quick to learn, it's all phonetic, so you don't really need to worry about spelling that bad. And as long as you can come back to it in two days and understand what you scribble down, you have written it correctly. So we really need to start bringing that back into the curriculum, I think, is what I'm saying. This one I also wanted to point out. Um, this is Hood Struggles by Kevin Guillard. I just kind of ran into this guy's, like, 
stand at a market when I was vacationing in New Orleans one time. And he was just selling these books. He's a self-published author. It's like fictionalized versions of Guillard's like actual experiences growing up. The cool thing about this is it's written in this very authentic vernacular. And I've been keeping up with this guy on Instagram. He just seems like a really cool guy who's just trying to sell his books. So I thought I would use whatever platform I had to talk about it. Uh, check this out if this sounds interesting to you. It's certainly going to be one of my next reads. Uh, he's just a cool guy. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to see the pattern here. Going through all this has been pretty helpful for me. On my booktuber wall, we want everything big or incendiary or otherwise recognizable from a distance. Obviously, my podcast books have to be there because that's the whole bit, but we can put stuff like Priory of the Orange Tree or the Weird Color John Green book to kind of fill out that negative space. For this, I really kind of want to keep all of my like works in translation or foreign language books, any other like nominally rare thing that has either like actual or sentimental value to me. I think I can fill all of that out, even if it's just like the random books that I've had autographed. In the back over here, we're going to keep all of everything else but in just like a more organized way i think once i clear out some of my cooler books from this back shelf put it over here or on the booktuber wall i'll have more space to consolidate my reference books or other like general fiction old high school books that i don't feel like getting rid of everything else i'll just ship off to a thrift store okay all right so stick with me we'll try to figure this out You know, honestly, I don't think this is any better. <laughs>